When you read a superhero comic book, you usually know what you're in for. The good guys win, the world is saved, and the villains learn that crime does not pay. But what happened when things go wrong? When the bad guys win or things seem absolutely hopeless? In these dark Marvel stories, our heroes face impossible odds and are torn down to their very lowest. Whether giving up on heroism altogether or being dragged to literal hell, these stories push the heroes to the very edge, forcing them to make morally questionable choices and question just what makes a hero. Some of these stories are alternate realities, but some involve the heroes of the main Marvel Universe facing their very bleakest moments. Spider-Man Reign Death isn't scary, giving up is. Spider-Man Reign takes place in a dark future version of New York where superheroes have been outlawed. Peter Parker is an old man down on his luck and completely miserable, a total loser stuck in a string of dead-end jobs he can't hold down. At the outset, he had already given up on being a hero and helping others, and was now a complete shut-in, weak and sniveling and haunted by his many failures. Crime had been wiped out, but at the expense of individual freedoms. New York was now controlled by a corrupt mayor and his police enforcers known as the Rain. One night, while walking home in the rain, a young boy on the run from the rain crashed into the elderly Peter Parker. He begged for Peter's help as the police wrestled him to the ground and violently beat him. For a moment, it seemed like the former Spider-Man might break out of his funk and save the boy, cracking a smirk and getting ready to launch insults at the cops in classic Spider-Man banter. But instead, he simply took a beating from the rain who smashed his nose and broke his arm. But the real pain came when, after pulling himself back up to his feet, Peter turned to see the boy's sister who asked him, You just let them take him? How could you? Peter walked away into the silence without saying anything. Just fired from his job, he was simply trying to bring home some flowers for Mary Jane, but they had been ruined in the scuffle. When he arrived back at his rundown apartment, he apologized to his sickly white redhead trying to explain what had happened. He begged her to speak to him, but she just sat there, silently. He lashed out, demanding her to speak. But in truth, no one was there. Peter was alone, haunted by the memory of his dead wife, Mary Jane. But before we explain just what is going on here, remember to subscribe to the channel with notifications on so you never miss an upload and hit that like button for some more Plot Armor comics. Peter Parker's life is famously a mess, perpetually broke or looking for a job or struggling in love. But this dark vision of Spider-Man's future took the old Parker luck to a whole other level. Peter wasn't just struggling though. He was in a seemingly endless spiral of depression and shame and had lost his marbles a little bit. Okay, a lot. Peter was trying to forget his life as Spider-Man and putting that whole great power, great responsibility mantra behind him. But a visit from his old boss, J. Jonah Jameson, pulled him back. Now regretting his years of calling Spidey a menace, Jameson was trying to make up for his misdeeds by fighting against the authoritarian government of New York that had stripped people of their freedoms and hope. He presented the decrepit Pete with a camera and Spider-Man mask to remind him who he used to be. Peter recoiled in horror and shame, collapsing to the ground in his underpants. You know, curling up and laying down naked on the floor, that famous thing superheroes do. Outside of Peter's apartment, the rain were beating Jameson for his protests against their authority. A few moments later, an underpants-wearing mask marauder dramatically descended from the sky. As if Peter was possessed by an outside force, Spider-Man was back, jumping and flipping and telling jokes. The rest of the series follows Peter as he grappled with reclaiming his identity as Spider-Man, while the mayor unleashed Spider-Man's old villains to capture and kill him. Spider-Man's reappearance inspired the people to stand up against the government and the authorities. As a crowd of protesters surrounded Parker's apartment, which had been reported at the site of Spider-Man's reappearance, the rain bombed his building. But leaping out from the smoke came a figure dressed in black. Spider-Man still lived. Putting the Spider-Man suit back on, it was as if he was suddenly a man possessed by an outside entity. The pathetic old man was replaced by the athletic, bounding, wisecracking Spider-Man. Peter couldn't even understand why he was suddenly behaving so differently. It was like the mask unleashed someone that he had long buried away. But even with his renewed vigor, he was no match for the combined might of the released Sinister Six who beat him bloody until the corpse of Dr. Octopus rescued him. Doc Ock's corpse was now being controlled by his mechanical arms and they were on a mission to save Spider-Man. Before he died, Ock had seen the wall crawler as a kind of brother. Octavius's arms had dragged Peter to a cemetery where he sat before the graves of May Parker, Ben Parker, and Mary Jane. Ock had dug up Mary Jane's corpse to retrieve what was buried with her, and that's when things got really weird. Confronted with the corpse of his beloved wife, Peter wrapped his arms around her and sobbed, remembering the last time he saw her alive. He tried to apologize to MJ's corpse, telling her how sorry he was that he had poisoned her. 
It wasn't just his blood that was radioactive, but all of the fluids in his body. Loving him had sentenced her to die. This is both extremely tragic and extremely disturbing in so many ways. His greatest regret, the thing that caused him to quit being Spider-Man, was when he left her on her deathbed to fight crime. He had promised to come back to her, but in the end could not be with her. Now tangled up with the dead body, its fingers clawing at his mouth, admitted his greatest shame. He was a liar. He had promised that he would rather rip out his own heart than harm Mary Jane, but he was the reason she was dead. With these words, Mary Jane was torn away from him by Ock's arms, leaving him bleeding and crying and chasing after her, where he was led to a coffin. Peter entered, ready to let go of his pathetic life. We warned you that these were the darkest Marvel stories of all time, and this won't even be the only time we see Spider-Man in a coffin in this video. The main conflict of the story, besides Peter Parker's internal torment and wrestling with reclaiming his identity as Spider-Man, is that the mayor of New York City intends to extend his authoritarian power by erecting a laser-powered grid around the entire city of Manhattan. This grid would close it off and make it inaccessible from the outside world in order to create a city free of crime, but at the cost of all freedom. Eventually, the comic reveals that the real power behind the mayor's efforts to close off New York and make it a police state was actually Venom, the evil symbiote who had moved on to a new host. The alien creature wanted revenge on Spider-Man for isolating and leaving him abandoned in the original black costume saga. Everything Venom had done to control New York was to spread that same fear and make the island of Manhattan a feeding ground for his symbiote spawn children. This version of Venom is particularly creepy, a pulsing black mass of goop that absorbs everything, all light, all people. He towers over everything and has an insatiable hunger and lust for violence. It is maybe the scariest Venom has ever been, especially his reveal where the black goo oozes out of his host's skin, down his teeth, and unleashes his tendrils that stab and absorb innocent bystanders. The story comes to its climax when Spider-Man emerges from the coffin reborn in his classic red and blue costume that Peter had buried alongside his wife so many years ago. The cowardly, shameful Peter Parker was dead and now Spider-Man was back and ready to fight and singing his classic theme song to boot. In the closing issue, Spider-Man tries to distract the symbiotes and free the people of New York from their new prison, in the process hoping to inspire them, even if it means sacrificing his own life. Through these efforts, Spider-Man becomes a symbol to the people that anyone can become a hero if they are willing to put their life on the line to save others. Spider-Man fights his way through the Sinister Six, quipping and jumping just like old times to get to Venom. All the while, symbiotes are rampaging, eating the people of the city and causing chaos. When Spidey finally confronts his old foe, he leads him to the top of the Empire State Building, to the laser grid isolating the city. The symbiotes follow him, beating him bloody, but Spidey has been newly inspired with an unfamiliar spark of hope. Now he was ready to fight the good fight in memory of Mary Jane, who always supported him. Surrounded by Venom and its countless offspring, Spidey detonates a massive explosion that destroys the laser grid and vanquishes the symbiotes. This dark future is a bleak vision of a world where every man Peter Parker is at the lowest he has ever been. It's a tale of how a man comes back from the brink after losing everything. Dark though it may be, it ends with a hopeful message that despair can be overcome and that acts of selflessness can ripple across society and inspire others to heroic action. Age of Apocalypse This is the time of your undoing. I have waited centuries for this day to dawn, and who, if any, are worthy enough to oppose me? None of you. From a dystopian alternate future to a twisted version of the present, the Age of Apocalypse is a depressing tale of how the death of one man can change all of reality. It all starts when Professor Xavier's son, the reality-warping, not-quite-sane mutant named Legion, traveled back in time to kill Magneto, the master of magnetism, for distorting his father's mission of peace between humanity and mutant kind. As Legion prepared to kill a younger Magneto before he could do any of his evil deeds, Xavier jumped in front of Legion's attack and he was killed instead. Legion was horrified at what he had done and screamed in horror when he realized the paradox he had created. But there was no time to deal with the weight of his actions before reality warped around him and the X-Men and they blinked out of existence. The echoes of this change to the time stream rippled through reality, ending all of creation in a wave of frozen crystal before all of existence shattered. In the place of Marvel Universe as readers knew it came a new age, the Age of Apocalypse. With no Professor Xavier to form the X-Men, the arrival of Apocalypse meant the end of the world. Apocalypse is one of the X-Men's greatest villains, an ancient mutant obsessed with the evolution and perfection of life on Earth through survival of the fittest. 
How dark is this reality? Well, Apocalypse sits upon a throne floating above a massive pyre where he breathes in the scent of hundreds of thousands of burning skeletons. I find the aroma... soothing. They were weak, and such is their fate. We enter into the world at a time when Apocalypse had already taken over the United States after a series of violent cullings of humanity. There are only small pockets of resistance, both human and mutant. These mutant traitors to Apocalypse are led by Magneto, who was inspired by Xavier's death to carry on his dream of uniting humans and mutants instead of supremacy. Now that Apocalypse ruled the US with an iron fist, he was entering into a peace treaty with the other nations of the world that would see an end to his campaign to kill off all humans and make a world of only the fittest and strongest mutants. Of course, due to his evil nature, he was lying. In truth, he was on the cusp of world domination and creating an even greater division between humans and mutants that would sink the planet into endless war. So dark was this age of apocalypse that when a young child living in one of Apocalypse's human work camps managed to survive being hunted by the disgusting mutant madman Sugarman, she couldn't even be happy because it meant she was still alive. Conditions in these work camps were so cruel and miserable that even children could not find any joy. This dark world saw all kinds of changes in characters, heroes and villains alike. One of the original X-Men, Hank McCoy aka Beast, was now a sadistic scientist at the service of Mr. Sinister and Apocalypse. This dark beast was a master of genetic experimentation and torture, and he did it gleefully. I am well compensated for my labors, but just between you and me, I do this for free. Meanwhile, Colossus is one of the most gentle characters in the regular Marvel Universe, but in this changed reality, he is a deadly grim enforcer for Magneto, responsible for training new X-Men and having them fight to the death. Tormented by his human sister, Ileana's murder, he had given up hope and joined Magneto's X-Men to put an end to Apocalypse. The main story of this brawling epic follows Magneto trying to set things right after encountering the time-traveling mutant Bishop. Bishop was the only survivor of the old reality because he was already a time-traveling paradox. With the help of Rogue's mutant powers to absorb people's memories, Magneto learned the truth of what reality should be and pledged to go back and save Xavier in order to prevent this apocalypse-ravaged present. The X-Men soon discovered that, in fact, Colossus' sister Ileana had survived and she might be the key to putting an end to this reality. They believed that she had latent mutant powers that would help them travel back in time. Colossus took his young X-Men to rescue Ileana from the human camps. They risked their lives fighting Sugarman and his evil guards. Things looked like they might work out, but reinforcements were soon called in. Desperate to keep his sister alive, Colossus left his trainees behind to fend for themselves as the evil forces of Apocalypse crashed down upon them. After getting his sister to safety, he eventually turned back to help the young freedom fighters, but upon seeing the horde of enemies and the impossible odds, he shamefully closed the gate behind him and collapsed in shame. He had willfully let the young mutants die. A selfless hero in the main universe, the Colossus of Age of Apocalypse was more concerned with being reunited with his sister than the greater good. This is just another example of how Age of Apocalypse is such a dark timeline. In the mainstream universe, Colossus is almost single-mindedly devoted to trying to do the right thing and fiercely loyal to his teammates. Showing him so morally compromised illustrates just how bad things had become. Meanwhile, a pair of mutant spies, Weapon X, this reality's version of Wolverine, and Jean Grey were working from intelligence provided by Mr. Sinister. Sinister opposed Apocalypse for his own selfish desires and helped the humans organize a massive rescue in what they called the Great Sentinel Airlift. This mission resulted in the rescue of thousands of humans from Apocalypse's grasp and carried them to Europe. But it was only a brief moment of victory and hope. Apocalypse was planning to decimate the entire world. To prevent Apocalypse's assault, Weapon X and the humans unleashed their massive payload of nuclear weapons upon the mutant-controlled US. Though he hoped to lead the charge, the bombs were sent through a portal without Logan. The mutant was upset that he would have to live with the consequences, having signing on to the mission believing he would die along with the villainous mutants. That way he would not need to feel the weight of the decisions he had made and the many lives that would be taken. As this all went on, the heroic mutants were beginning to hope that maybe they could change things for the better. But Apocalypse had discovered Magneto's secret base and confronted him. The two engaged in an epic battle, both unleashing their mighty powers upon the other. In the end, Apocalypse managed to capture Magneto, but Magneto did not regret his actions that led to his capture and possible death. 
He believed that his X-Men could recover the dream of his fallen friend, Charles Xavier. The final key to the X-Men strategy to rewrite history was the m -Karan Crystal, the nexus of all realities, a cosmic relic that held all of the knowledge of the universe and the power to alter creation, and Apocalypse was holding it as bait to lure the X-Men to him. Now, you might be able to guess that the X-Men did eventually set reality back to the way it was, given that they are not still telling stories where Apocalypse rules the planet. But even in victory, the X-Men still lose. Rewriting reality had great personal costs for the heroes. Magneto had to make the decision to live in a world where his son never existed, while Ileana agreed to sacrifice herself to bring back a reality where she had died. But they do it for the chance of hope. As Ileana says, I'd rather have hope than nothing at all. There is no truly happy ending here, no matter the outcome. As the X-Men began their final desperate assault, the atomic destruction from the human freedom fighters in Europe was making its way toward Apocalypse's base in New York, threatening the lives of all the X-Men. The only thing that held the nuclear destruction back was Jean Grey's telekinetic power. The war had begun and Apocalypse was readying his counter-strike to destroy Europe and humanity's refuge. This was the only chance they would ever have to set things right. They managed to get Ileana to the crystal where she used its powers to amplify her own abilities and create a portal through time for Bishop to return to the moment Legion killed Xavier. But they had to contend with more than just the villains. Colossus went crazy trying to stop Ileana from sacrificing herself and fought his fellow X-Men. To stop his rampage, his wife Kitty Pride stepped in front of him, believing he would never hurt her. Unfortunately, he couldn't stop himself and killed her with his incredible strength. Utterly mortified by his actions, he collapsed, leaving an opening for Gambit to shoot him with his explosive powers. Ileana returned from entering the Amkron Crystal and sending Bishop back in time, but he was dying. He admitted to Ileana that he was so scared and that he was no hero. Remember what we said about no happy endings? As Bishop traveled to the past, Magneto fought to keep Apocalypse away from the Crystal and the two powerful mutants engaged in an epic rematch for the ages. With everything on the line, they unleashed all of their power upon one another. Bishop confronted Legion, daring the young mutant to peer into his mind and see the consequences of his actions. Upon seeing the fallout of his attack, Legion broke down literally and metaphorically. Ashamed of what he had done, Legion's powers overloaded and wiped him out of reality. Bishop began to fade as well. The alternate timeline was successfully averted. As the Age of Apocalypse crumbled, Magneto unleashed the true might of his magnetic mastery upon the tyrant and ripped Apocalypse in two. In Apocalypse's final moments, Magneto taunted him. For 20 years, you've gone on and on about how only the strong survive. Tell me again, Apocalypse, just how strong you are. The victory was short-lived and bittersweet as the alternate timeline collapsed. Magneto held his wife and child, remembering the man who inspired him to hope as existence collapsed into white nothingness around them. Phew, ready for a breather yet? Well, that's a shame if so, because the darkness keeps coming. We haven't even covered the Hulk versus the devil yet. Craven's last hunt. I will die soon. I must die soon, but not yet. It's raining in New York City, and you know what that means, it's going to be a sad story. As this classic Spider-Man tale set in the main Marvel continuity begins, Spider-Man is in a very dark place, and as usual, when Peter Parker gets sad or angry, he's in his black costume. His friend Ned Leeds had just died and consumed with the thoughts of death, he joined some petty crooks for the funeral of a criminal named Joe Face. As he watched, he couldn't help but wonder why he should care if this man was dead. Still, he did and came to pay his respects. Peter Parker had seen so many people die, when would his time be, he wondered. We didn't say this was a list of the most feel-good Marvel stories after all. Spidey was not the only one contemplating his mortality. His old enemy, Craven the Hunter, was facing the end of his own life, aging and falling ill. He was determined to prove his superiority over his greatest game, Spider-Man. After losing to him so many times, Craven had become obsessed with the idea of proving himself to be stronger and better than Spider-Man before he died. And to do that, he would have to face and kill Spider-Man. It should also be said that in addition to dying, Craven was also losing his grasp on reality. He had begun to hallucinate that Spider-Man was not just a wall-crawling crime fighter, but an embodiment of some great societal evil. The same evil that destroyed the Russian aristocracy from which he descended. The same evil that caused his mother to go mad. In order to prepare for their final battle, Craven immersed himself in Spider-Man's being, burying himself in a sea of spiders and feasting on them. He believed this prepared him to absorb and know Spider-Man intimately. 
By feasting on the essence of the spider, he could understand it. Pretty gross, Craven. Distraught and distracted by his own anxiety, Spidey was caught by surprise and hit by one of Craven's darts. He tried to fight back, but the dart was drugged and he was rapidly losing consciousness. Craven caught Spider Man in his net, leaving Spider Man trapped and defenseless. Dizzy from the poison but determined to escape, Spider Man tried his usual banter, but Craven slowly walked toward him. Spidey saw something strange in Craven's eyes. This was not the arrogant man he knew. Craven had become overcome with a horrifying madness and malice. Craven raised a shotgun to Spidey's head. Spider Man could do nothing but look on in terror as the hunter pulled the trigger. Blam! In the first issue's final pages, Craven looked on as Spider Man was buried in a coffin, tears running down his face in the rain. Craven's next step in his victory over the spider was to prove he was a better, more effective hero. He approached Spider-Man's grave marker, adorned with the words, Here lies Spider-Man, slain by the hunter. But he was not dressed in his usual hunting garb, instead wearing a copy of Spider-Man's costume. He removed the mask and began to laugh uncontrollably. To fully take on Spider-Man's being, Craven began to crawl, embodying his enemy's movements. He soon hallucinated a monstrous spider creature and entered into a metaphysical battle with the representation of his fears. Even as he did all of this, part of him recognized its madness and asked himself why he was doing any of it. The madness had consumed him, and he blamed Spider-Man, or the entity that possessed him, for his family's fall from grace and Russia's global decline. Part of him knew that he had only created this hallucination to cope with his failure to defeat a mere human such as Spider-Man. Another part of him was convinced that the only way Kraven the Hunter could lose was if Spider-Man was some ancient force. This story paints a particularly tragic image of Kraven, who was one of Spider-Man's more pathetic villains up to that point. A guy who dressed in a lion's pelt and carried an old-fashioned spear. He was not much of a physical threat, but giving him such a psychological examination gave him a whole new dimension. His massive ego, combined with whatever terminal illness was looming over Craven's head, led to a psychotic break. Having faced the spider demon, it was time to prove he was a better hero than the original wall crawler. Craven went on a violent crusade, even rescuing Mary Jane, who was looking for her missing husband from a mugging. Seeing how brutally he beat her attackers, MJ knew that Peter was not behind the mask and feared something horrible had happened to him. Craven turned his sights on a mutated creature called Vermin, who Spider-Man only managed to defeat with the help of Captain America sometime earlier. By single-handedly defeating an enemy Spider-Man could not, Craven would prove his greatness. Craven tracked Vermin down through the stinking sewers of New York City and beat him brutally, wailing on the simple-minded cannibal as he thrashed and cut at Craven. But the hunter ignored the pain and rose victorious over his prey. As Craven accomplished his mission, a hand rose out from Spider Man's grave. It turns out that Craven hadn't killed Spider Man. In truth, the hunter had shot Spider Man full of drugs that left him catatonic for two weeks. Buried beneath the ground, Peter was left to hallucinate as he flitted in and out of consciousness. Six feet underground, he was tormented by visions of his dead friend Ned Leeds and monsters squashing him, and the image of Craven taunting him. Spider Man clawed his way out of the coffin and through the layers of dirt, dramatically bursting out from beneath the ground. Groggy and sickly, he managed to stumble half-conscious back home to Mary Jane, who had nearly given up hope that Peter was still alive. Reunited, the two embraced. Their love for one another was the only thing that had kept both going, and now they were back together. But Spider-Man could not let Craven continue prowling around in his name and prepared to leave in the middle of the night. With her husband crouched in the window, Mary Jane made Peter promise he would return. He took her hand endearingly before leaping from the window to confront his killer. Spidey arrived at Craven's lair, where the hunter was keeping Vermin locked up in a cage and torturing him while disguised as Spider-Man. Upon seeing this, the real Spider-Man was horrified and began to beat Craven in anger. But Craven no longer had any desire to fight. He had already won. He had killed Spider-Man symbolically by burying him and defeating Vermin. Craven felt that the wall crawler would be dead if he had wished it to be so. By burying him and donning his skin, he proved himself superior to his enemy. Craven then unleashed Vermin to attack Spider-Man. Silently, the hunter watched as Vermin attack the exhausted Spider-Man. In a brief moment of clarity, amid his madness, Craven realized all that he had done. He chased Vermin off and helped Spider-Man to his feet. He had won, and that was enough. He finally saw the man beneath the mask, not the ancient creature he had imagined. 
He let Spider-Man go, encouraged him to track down vermin, and promised that he would never hunt again. Spider-Man was skeptical, but believed Craven to be a man of his word, honorable in his own way. After Spider-Man left, Craven pondered the unfamiliar feeling of accomplishment as he raised his gun and turned it upon himself. It doesn't get much darker or tragic than this. Spider-Man went on to catch Vermin and reunite with his wife Mary Jane, but the victory wasn't a particularly happy one given all that they had just went through. The best they could manage was gratitude that they were back together. But don't let it get you down, we're about to talk about the Elite X-Men Kill Squad for a pick-me-up. X-Force, Angels and Demons You think I don't know the line I'm crossing? I do. This is an X-Men work, this is X-Force, no one can know. Now this is a series that really pushed the boundaries of what superhero stories could depict and still be considered a story about heroes. It's a bloody story of clandestine spies and assassins led by Wolverine tasked with eliminating the biggest threats to mutant kind while exploring the moral questions of their actions. Did I mention it's bloody? In the first two issues alone, nearly 50 people were killed. The setup is this, mutant kind has been decimated after the events of House of M with only a few hundred left. They were further whittled down by a massacre at the hands of the religious zealots known as the Purifiers who consider mutants to be literal demon spawn. Cyclops, the leader of the X-Men and now all of the remaining mutants alive on the planet Earth believed they needed a team to proactively deal with threats to their endangered species. That's where Wolverine came in. Wolverine was bred to do that kind of thing and was more than willing to do what needed to be done. But he was furious to discover Cyclops had enlisted younger mutants that Wolverine believed should be left out of such dirty work. This included X-23, his artificially created daughter, as well as the young mutant shapeshifter Wolfsbane. Wolverine tried to talk X-23 out of being part of the X-Force, warning her that once she started down this killer path, nothing could ever wash her hands clean. But having survived torture and experimentation, X-23 was prepared to follow in Wolverine's footsteps and live in his morally compromised, blood-stained world. This would be the start of what would become known in the world of X-Men as the Schism. A split developed between the mutants into two factions, one led by Cyclops and the other by Wolverine. They disagreed on how to cope with their decimated status and how to survive. In the short term though, Wolverine agreed that bad needs needed doing for the right reasons and was willing to do those bad things. Together with a Native American mutant codenamed Warpath, this team of mutant assassins came together to deal with the Purifiers. In their first mission, Wolf's Bane was captured. When fellow X-Men Angel found out about this, he wanted to tell the rest of the X-Men, but Cyclops forbade it, warning Angel that this was a covert operation that couldn't become public knowledge. Cyclops may have a reputation for being a bland character, but throughout this series, he was getting progressively more underhanded and morally compromised, making all kinds of harsh decisions for what he believed was mutant survival. When he began to see his fellow mutants as pieces to move around a board as opposed to people, he had gone too far, even for Wolverine. But there was no time for Wolverine and Cyclops to argue because they had a teammate to rescue. After raiding purifier bases throughout the Midwest leaving a bloody path behind them, X-Force eventually managed to free Wolfsbane. Unfortunately, she was horribly tortured and in bad shape. They were also unaware that the purifiers had succeeded in revitalizing the advanced human sentinel hybrid known as Bastion to lead them to a world without mutants, who then recruited some of the X-Men's greatest anti-mutant foes and turned them into deadly ghoulish cyborgs bent on wiping out all of mutant kind. While the mutant healer Elixir tended to Wolfsbane, Wolverine lectured X-23, furious at her for being unable to feel empathy for her fellow mutants. X-23 was focused only on the strategy and trying to figure out why the purifiers left Wolfsbane alive. But Wolverine was trying to convince her to see that saving lives was the most important thing, not taking orders or fulfilling a mission. A short time later, Wolfsbane awoke and ruthlessly attacked Angel and Elixir. She viciously tore off Angel's wings and then escaped. X-23 tried to stop her, but she remembered Wolverine's lecture and refused to fight her fellow mutant. Instead, Wolfsbane brutally assaulted her and left X-23 unconscious and bleeding. Later, after healing, X-23 discovered that Elixir was unable to affect Angel's wings because they were made of inorganic matter. At the same time, the evil purifiers had discovered that Angel's wings contained what they called the Apocalypse Strand and that from one drop of blood from the wings, they could grow metallic wings inside a host body. This was a revelation that the experiments and transformation that Apocalypse had performed on Angel years ago to make him one of his horsemen were still a part of him, although he had appeared to be cured. The purifiers planned to use Angel's wings to create an army of flying mutant murdering soldiers. 
Soon Angel screamed in pain as Wolverine and Warpath tried to hold him down, but he was too strong for them and fought them off. As he roared in agony, new metallic wings sprouted from his back and turned blue. The Archangel had returned, Angel's dark persona created by Apocalypse's manipulation many years prior. It's just another horrific scene among many, too many in fact to describe in this list. Let's just say that Archangel has a tough time trying to fight the violent urges that come with the return of his apocalypse imbued powers. X-Force is a fascinating and compelling series that ran for more than two years and asks big questions and deals with heavy themes of violence and emotional costs of war. It's not a feel-good series by any means, but definitely one worth reading as it explores the inner lives of some of the X-Men's most complex characters. And it's got plenty of bloody action for those who just like to see Wolverine slice things. The same can be said, minus the Wolverine slicing part, for our final story, which sees the Hulk dragged to hell and back multiple times. Immortal Hulk. The night is his time. Like X-Force, this is one gruesome book. It takes the Hulk and puts it through a horror lens, turning his transformation into a disgusting body-distorting nightmare. After multiple deaths and resurrections, the Hulk has returned as a creature of the night. In the series' debut issue, Bruce Banner has been traveling the country and laying low after recovering from being killed by his fellow Avenger Hawkeye. Immortal Hulk is one of Marvel's most complex and character-driven stories, and describing it briefly is near impossible. So we'll run through the highlights and explain it why it deserves to be on this list of the darkest Marvel stories. Like Kraven's Last Hunt and X-Force, this is set in continuity, not an alternate reality like Age of Apocalypse or Spider-Man Reign, and it makes it all the more horrifying. Banner's attempts to lay low ended when, in the wrong place at the wrong time, he witnessed a young girl shot and killed during a robbery. Before he could protest, the robber shot Banner point-blank in the skull, killing him immediately. But upon nightfall, Banner awoke in the morgue and turned green. On the outskirts of town, the robber, a young man named Tommy, returned to his gang, shaken from what he had done. A thunderous boom rocked the warehouse and the gang scattered, looking for who might have attacked them. One by one, the crew is picked off as green massive hands break through the walls. Tommy tried to escape, fumbling with his key in his car's lock, but the monster caught up with him, revealing itself as the Incredible Hulk, alive and well and more intelligent and frightening than ever. Sandra Ann Brockhurst, the Hulk told Tommy. That was her name. She was 12. Instead of smashing and destroying Tommy, the Hulk taunted the boy, calling him weak and saying the gun gave him a false sense of power that he couldn't wait to unleash. Frightened, Tommy shot the Hulk three times, but the bullets harmlessly bounced off his body. Hulk explained that he was able to track Tommy because he could smell a liar. And ever since he killed that girl, Tommy had been lying to himself that he was not a bad guy. Tommy begged for his life, pleaded with the Hulk that he wasn't really a bad guy. Was he? Hulk just smiled and asked, What do you think? Before everything went black. The boy woke up in the hospital, his body absolutely shattered. This new Hulk was an entirely new personality never seen before. A crusader for justice with a twisted sense of morality who avenged the abused or downtrodden by inflicting twisted punishments befitting their crimes. In a small town, Hulk encountered a gamma-powered vampire who fed on the life force of strangers to stay alive. The vampire was afraid of being lost in the abyss and nothingness of death, so Hulk buried him deep below the ground, where he would be forever surrounded by nothingness. As the debut issue closed, Banner looked in the mirror where he saw the Hulk in his reflection and asked Hulk the same question Tommy had. I'm not a bad person, am I? This new Hulk, who would later call himself the Devil Hulk, was born as a protector personality for Bruce Banner to survive the abuses of his father. Banner had long buried this particular personality beneath his other Hulk personas, fearing the devoted and violent loyalty it had to him and the potential violence it could unleash. But now, after so many deaths, the devil was free. However, he only transformed at night and was weakened during the day. No matter how hurt Banner was, even if he was dead once night came, he was healed and Hulk would be free. Over time, as he continued traveling the country, Hulk came across a number of gamma radiation-powered enemies, all of whom started talking in horror about seeing a green door and someone staring at them through the door, someone frightening and from below. The mystery of this green door and the truth behind Hulk's seeming immortality are the main focus of the series. In a battle with the Canadian superhero called Sasquatch, a fellow gamma-powered superhero possessed by an unknown entity, Sasquatch killed Banner. It hurt to die, doesn't it, Bruce? He asked. As he bled out on the floor, Banner's eyes turned green, managing to choke out the word, Always, before transforming into the Hulk. 
And when you hurt Banner, Hulk warned Sasquatch, I take it personal. The two super-powered brawlers fought, smashing through walls as they traded incredible blows. In the middle of the night, Hulk got a glimpse of Sasquatch's reflection and saw staring back at him the specter of Bruce Banner's abusive father who called him a little monster. This rattled the Hulk, and Sasquatch began to beat him savagely, saying he always knew Bruce had a monster inside of him and that he should have killed him in the crib. Not exactly the kind of thing you want to hear your dad say about you, especially when he's a hairy brute slashing claws at you. Despite his strength, Hulk cowered in fear at his father's presence, the scars of his abusive relationship never fully healing. Banner's father accused him of being scared, which made the Hulk furious and managed to snap him out of his cowering. He raged at Sasquatch and demanded to know who opened the green door and brought the gamma-powered mutates back after death. Hulk continued to beat an explanation out of his enemy. He explained that there was something that used people, wearing their souls like a mask. The only explanation he gave was these haunting words. Every light casts a shadow. In every mirror there is a reflection. As above, so below. Sasquatch gouged out the Hulk's eyes and taunted him to see the truth. As the possessed monster threatened to murder children, Hulk lashed out realizing that somehow it was the gamma radiation that opened the green door. He then revealed a new ability. He could absorb the gamma radiation from other beings. Hulk took in the Sasquatch's power which violently and gruesomely transformed the beast back into his human form. Walking through the lonely night, Hulk turned to look at his reflection and saw the image of his father staring back at him. By absorbing Sasquatch's gamma, Banner also absorbed the twisted spirit of his father who now lived in his mind alongside the various Hulk personalities. Soon the Avengers approached the Hulk to try to convince him to stop his new twisted form of justice. But as often happens when the Avengers try to calm down the Hulk, they end up fighting. Hulk was more powerful than ever and laid waste to the Earth's mightiest heroes. His strength was so great it frightened Thor, who feared that the Hulk had moved beyond mere mortals and had become a kind of god or devil. After destroying Iron Man's Hulkbuster armor and swatting away the She-Hulk as if she was nothing, Tony Stark escaped and retreated to an aircraft high above the battlefield. Desperate to stop Hulk, Tony fired the ship's massive laser which resulted in an explosion that leveled an entire town. Captain America and Black Panther looked down at the charred corpse of Bruce Banner horrified. Tony explained that this was the only thing that could stop the Hulk's rampage, but Captain America couldn't get past the fact that they had killed their old friend. Black Panther reminded Cap that it was a temporary measure and that once Hulk was captured and they removed the artificial sunlight that kept his transformation at bay, the Hulk would live again. Sometimes you just have to wonder just how good a friend Iron Man really is. First he shot Hulk into space to get rid of him and now he flat out killed him. Even if they were pretty sure he'd get better, killing Bruce Banner and saying it was for his own good is pretty dark, which is part of why it made this list. The Avengers handed Banner off to Thunderbolt Ross, Hulk's former father-in-law and longtime nemesis from the US military. Ross gave the corpse over to Shadow Base, a secret military black site deep underground. Hulk awoke in an underground laboratory where his body had been cut into pieces and jarred before nightfall, leaving Hulk helplessly sitting on a shelf. Pretty grim stuff. These gross experiments with Hulk being torn apart and studied were not even the darkest part of the series, although it is maybe the best example of just how gross and twisted the story could be. Hulk eventually managed to escape his jar containment and heal himself, but he did so by reconstituting his body around the scientist who tortured him, literally absorbing and killing the man. While that is some pretty nasty stuff, the darkest parts of the series had to do with the exploration of Hulk's greatest enemy, the one below all, who resided in the below place. The Hulk eventually ended up in a place below hell. Hulk learned that this place had become a kind of staging area for anyone with gamma in their blood who was killed. After death, they would arrive in this below place until the green door appeared and they walked through the back into their earthly bodies. But none can ever remember traveling through this place. Traveling through the place below all, Hulk was tormented by figments of hatred and fear from his past, which caused the Devil Hulk to lose control. In his place, the classic Savage Hulk re-emerged. The Savage Hulk unleashed his fury and rage and sadness on the monsters until he was eventually talked down by his new friend, a reporter who was following the Hulk's recent exploits. He broke down in tears, begging to know, 
Why Hulk have to hurt so much? The story soon revealed that the Hulk and all gamma power in the Marvel Universe had been directly connected to a kind of metaphysical tormenting spirit, and that the gamma explosion that created the Hulk had cracked open the door between realities. It had made a connection with Bruce Banner's father, and had been playing a twisted game with Hulk in his world, using Hulk as a kind of judgement and testing his and humankind's resilience. In the place below all, it revealed itself, an entity that howls through many mouths and breaks with many hands. As Hulk traveled through the below place, the narration asked the reader to imagine, what is the opposite of God? In other words, does God have a Hulk? The series goes on, twisting and turning, dealing with heavy questions of ethics, spirituality, religion and science, and human vanity and anger. Hulk even used his power to try and fight for the environment against humanity's abuses, inspiring a youth environmental movement. All of these difficult and dark questions are brought to life through gruesome and grotesque transformations and monstrous abominations. In the end, Hulk came face to face with evil itself, God's Hulk, to demand why he has to suffer so much pain. What does he learn? What does this being say? The Hulk is one of his great creations, a destroyer and creator, made to be a counterweight between the destruction and creation that the one above all and its opposite represent. Ultimately, Hulk was left unsatisfied but decided he will be whatever he wants to be, no matter what cosmic games might ensnare him. You might have never guessed the Marvel Universe could get so twisted, so depressing, so gruesome, but now you know just how dark these superhero stories can go. Well, that does it for this video. I'm Morse Code, and on behalf of Plot Armor Comics, thanks for watching, and remember to subscribe to the channel for more recaps and wild stories like this one.